Rushing Wind Biker Church at 10 Peach Tree Court in Holbrook, New York, the crossroads of freedom and faith. God bless you all. Jesus loves you all. Okay, let's pray while he's doing that. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for uh, this place. We just thank you, Lord, for your love. Father, as we uh, sit before your feet and allow you to speak power into our lives, Lord, let us uh, give you all of our attention. Um, Lord, it, it just blows our mind that the, uh, the God of all creation would, would come and, and speak with us, that knows everyone in this place, and just sees our lives and sees what we go through individually. And Lord, let, us, let everyone here just feel your individual presence in their life tonight. Um, Lord, we know that that is your heart, to commune with each one of us individually and not just come here and, and throw a blanket thing over this whole thing, but individually touch everyone. Lord, we pray they accept it, they feel it. Lord, change lives today. We thank you for your son whose death and resurrection has given us new life, new power, and the ability to walk in this world with a strength that is beyond what human resource can give us. That's our, our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. So how are we doing? Awesome. awesome. Yeah. Everybody hold your ears. Try a microphone again, please. Check, check, check. Am I, am I on now? No, I can hear you, though. Okay. So, what? Does everybody realize that our enemy is referred to as the prince of the power of the air? Yes. It's totally unrelated to my message, by the way. See, because Satan has taken grip of the airwaves, we have no doubt when we listen to the modern music of today. And he's taken control of the visual rays we see. Uh, media is where the enemy does his best work. Amen? Amen. It's what we see on television. It's what we, we, we hear and we, we put into our ears. And, uh, and so the enemy always wants to attack the sound system of the church. <laughs> this is nothing new. So uh, just be aware, the enemy does not want you hearing this message tonight. Um, but we're going to do this anyway. Amen? Amen. Amen? Because God is sovereign and Satan is a liar. Amen. He's a deceiver. Yes. And uh, we're going to kick his butt tonight. Amen? Amen. And, and as, uh, as I think Jerry said, uh, the church has been on a defensive mode too long. We are to go on the attack. You know, the Bible tells us, Jesus said, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we are called to kick open the gates of hell because this realm of, of, of humanity, this earth, is the realm of the evil one. And we are going to kick gates open. We're going to take no prisoners. We're going to do a lot of damage to the powers of darkness. Right. Amen? Amen? And so with all the authority of Jesus Christ, we claim this building, this service, this message. Yes. And uh, the Bible says when we call the enemy out, he has to flee. Because he can't be in the presence of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. So we're going to give another shot, and we're going to go... Uh, we suggest, we're suggesting a handheld. Oh. Or you just go without. I got to be coordinated tonight, you're telling me. <laughs> I'm just asking. Can, can you hear me back there? Do I need a microphone? Go ahead. All right. How are we doing back there, Bobby? Can you hear me? Amen. Lock the doors. You can always tell by who's, who's, uh, who's in the back rows that uh, they're looking for the exits as soon as they come in. You know? So, so uh, I'm preaching this series of messages through, uh, through my book, No Sting, for those who haven't been here before, and, and uh, I'm blessed, you know, that my sister gave a testimony, really it was birthed out of this particular chapter of the book, and it's entitled, How to Turn Your Cross into a Mantle, uh, and I'll explain that as we, as we go on. See, as, um, 
as followers of Jesus Christ, we're not exempt from the suffering of the human realm. Amen. We're not exempt from the trials and the tribulations. And um, when I was diagnosed with this disease, I did a lot of soul searching and, and, and asking God why. You know, why, why would you allow this into, into my life? And it's funny because I minister to a whole community of people who are so far from God. And, and, and they have this mentality, well, you know, you know, Ski's the God guy. That's not supposed to happen to him. And that's a lie. And it's travesty. Tra tragedy. Travesty. One of those words. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, we have these scriptures that say all things work together for good. To so those right. who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And sometimes we struggle with, I know what it says, but I ain't feeling it right now. Anybody ever go through that? Yes. You know? Yes. And, and we know God's promises are, are yea and amen, and they're 100% they're right. going to come to fruition. They're true in our lives, but sometimes we struggle with this humanity. You know, and, and why this particular disease for me? And, and, and I preached this message actually three times, but I haven't talked about what I'm going to talk about now, um, which is something I touch on in the book, is God knows every one of us. Amen? Amen. He knows your, your, your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. He knows how to speak to you uh, differently than the person who's sitting next to you, the person who's standing next to you. He knows your gifts. He knows your talents. He knows every breath. And the, and the Bible says he even knows the amount of hair on your head. <laughs> And so when something comes into our life, it is case specific to you. When God allows something to come into our life, what it is, the dynamic, is case specific to who you are and what your makeup is and how God can use you most profoundly and how he can speak to you in the most intimate of ways. And it's kind of ironic and it's kind of almost an amusing um, kind of irony that I have what's called mantle cell lymphoma, which I never heard of this. I didn't even know there was a mantle cell That's right. in my body. Yeah. All I knew is Mickey Mantle was a good ball player. He <laughs> <laughs> was, wasn't he? You know? And it's funny because my idol growing up was Mickey Mantle. You know, and, and so I went through my life, and this was a big part of. You know, my life, baseball was my idol for most of my life. And we know that we can idolize things and people That's right. above God. And when I was in the world and when, when the, the hard things of life uh, were really coming at me and kind of oppressing me my entire life, baseball was my God. It was my idol. When I stepped on a ball field, I was in a different world. And all the problems disappeared. Now, I remember one of the most profound moments uh, I ever had on a ball field. Uh, I went to uh, a Promise Keepers. It was a big men's organization, the fellowship that came out maybe 30 years ago. I had my two sons with me. And, uh, and they had a big outing at Shea Stadium. I think it was still Shea Stadium back then. Yeah. No, not City Park or whatever they want to call it nowadays. You know, and I remember we had this morning meeting. And I walked out onto the field at Shea Stadium. And it was the sun coming over left field. And the dew was sparkling on the grass. Now, if you haven't played ball and, and you haven't had, the, you've got something in your life that it just, I felt like I was in heaven. Because God met me on a baseball field. Because that's how God needed to speak to me. So when the, when the doctor comes to you and says, you have metal cell lymphoma, I knew God was speaking something to me. Because there are, I've come to know hundreds of, you know, cancers, and even lymphomas. And, and this is very rare, very specific. And so we all have things that come into our life that are individual to how God wants to speak into our lives. And the thing is, we don't really walk in the power of Jesus Christ until something comes into our life. You know, it's easy to, to think God is good when everything is fine. Amen? Right. Yeah. And we kind of want that. 
don't we? Yes. Yeah, I had a couple honest people in the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't we like life to be like those, those preachers that say you give your life to Christ and everything is great? Oh, yeah. And the bills always get paid and, and you can have health and you can have all this other stuff. Well, right. uh, unfortunately or fortunately, that's not, not, not the reality. And how many people here right now are going through some hard things in your life? You know, yeah. Pretty much everyone. And, and it could be financial, it could be relational, there could be health issues in here. You know, it could be job, job lost, not happy on your job. It could be pretty much everything. And how do you deal with it? In reality, how do you, how do you deal with it? You know, it's hard, isn't it? You know, these things can bring us into depression, can't they? And they can make us anxious. You know, if those bills are piling up and the job's shaking. And maybe you, you, you have health <laughs> symptoms and you don't know what it is yet. And the enemy can get in and, and cause depression. You know? And so there's, there may be some people in here that are actually going through a very good time in their life. Maybe you are in a stable financial position. And maybe your health is, is, is good. There are challenges. And maybe your family is, is functional, as opposed to the majority of all of us. Right? <laughs> and so, praise God for that, right? right. Amen. Amen. Now, unfortunately, that's an easy testimony. You know, there are people out there that are so far from God, they have great lives. Right? They've got good jobs. They're making good money. The bills are paid. The kids are seem normal, I guess. You know? And so where's the difference? Where's the difference that Jesus makes when everything is fine? Because you could be a Buddhist and everything could be fine. And you could be a Muslim and everything could be fine. You could be an atheist and everything's going well. And so when you're a Christian and everything's going well, Praise God, look at my God. That has a minimal amount of testimony involved in it. That's right. I don't know if you realize that. We all want that, don't we? Yes. But the thing is, when we give our life to Christ, the most important thing we should strive for is that Jesus Christ could be seen through us to the world in the most profound way. Amen? Amen. How many people want that? Amen. You know, if God came here and you had the chance to ask God, you know, Lord, I really want to make an impact in this world for Jesus Christ. I, I want you to, 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 to just do something with me so I can move in a powerful way and, and lives are changed and eternities are changed. Just whatever you need to do, do it for me. How many people want that? Right, what if God came to you and said, you need to have cancer to do it? How many people are uh, jumping on board of that? We got some. That's a hard question, ain't it? I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't invite evil. I'm not saying we should invite things into our life. I'm saying that this world puts things on us. And, and, and God allows it because Satan cannot touch you unless God allows it. You know, if you look at your lives and look back, there are so many times that God protected you. Amen? Amen. That you might have done something so stupid in a moment, but you didn't really pay what the, the, the repercussions of those things could have been. Amen? Amen. Or, or, or you could like step off the curb and then a car comes flashing in front of you. And it's like, if I, if I would have taken a second step, things would have been different. And I think all of us can look back into our lives and know that God protected us. Even before we were saved. Which is important when we give our life to Christ to look back into the life when we weren't saved. Because God protected you to bring you to the place of having revelation and relationship. Amen. And have your eternity set. And so we can look back at those things. We know that God protected us. But you also need to understand that in order for Satan to touch you, God has to take that protection off. We know that from Job. If you're here today, Satan is constantly going to heaven, speaking to God and saying, 
I want a piece of Vinny. I think I can flip Vinny on you. <laughs> you let me get to Vinny, and I, uh, Vinny's going to curse you. You know? Or Kathy. You, Kathy. Satan's going up to heaven and saying, you know, if you just give me a little, give me a little opening, you know, I, I, can, I can take your faith right away. And these are the conversations that, that exist, and some of you may not know that today. That Satan constantly is going up and asking permission. Because if you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, Satan cannot touch you unless he has God's permission. That almost sounds cruel, doesn't it? Why would God take his protection off of us? Doesn't that sound, sound cruel? But the thing is, God has put something in you called faith. And faith is put in, for, in you, not so much for you, but so that the world could see the power of God and the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in you when you stand. And when Satan comes at you with his best, and you say, go at it, because greater is he that is in me. And, and I don't know what's happening with this cancer, and it may take me out in a month, but I'm going to wreck your kingdom for a month like you've never seen. That's right. And if God keeps me for 20 years, I'm going to wreck your kingdom for 20 years. And you're going to be paying for that. You know? And that's the way we need to address these things. You know, a lot of people look happy when they don't have Jesus. God gives us opportunity. And that's what I want to share tonight is we're all going to have tough stuff come into our life. And understand we are to look at it and say, Lord, why have you allowed this thing for this season? And God will show you the most powerful thing you can do in your life. Maybe through that very thing that you would never choose. You know, I would never choose to have cancer. I would be stupid, you know. Um, but if I got it, God's going to get glory in it. See, I want to start with the book of the Old Testament and the story of the Old Testament of Elijah the prophet. How many people have heard of Elijah? Elijah is one of the most powerful, most important prophets of the Old Testament. He did miraculous things on par with no other prophets in the, in the Old Testament. You know, he controlled the rain. Stop the rain to show God. They brought the rain to show God. He brought fire down from heaven to show the power of God. You know, he, he, he raised uh, a widow's son from the dead. You know, some of you may not know that Jesus wasn't the only one that raised someone from the dead. Elijah raised uh, a man's son, a widow's son, from the dead. So Elijah walked with extraordinary power, and everyone knew it. It's like, here comes Elijah. You know? You don't want to mess with Elijah, because God walks where Elijah walks. And everyone knew it. How many people would love to have that? Now, you just scared, you just scared the crap out of Satan everywhere you go. Just like, you know, I got a friend down in North Carolina who's got a, a church, one of the Freedom Biker churches, and Years ago, when I met him, before he was a pastor, he said his goal every morning was when he woke up and opened his eyes, he wanted Satan to be aware. You know, he wanted Satan to be worried. You know, JD's, JD's awake today. <laughs> so we got to watch, watch what's going on. And, and Elijah had an identifier. He had a cloak. And it was a cloak that was adorned. And it was called his mantle. And when Elijah was coming from a distance, you could see that's Elijah that's coming. And with that thought came the understanding that God's power is coming in our direction from that man. Because he was known as a powerful man of God. This word mantle in the Old Testament has only been used 14 times. And, and the majority of those times are used for this particular instance of Elijah. And there's two different definitions, but the one that only applies to Elijah's mantle is the Hebrew word adareth. And this word adareth speaks of glory and splendor and magnificence. And then one of the smaller definitions is a prophet's mantle. And so when, when you look at the Hebrew and you look at a definition of the word, that word encompasses all the definitions. <coughs> Hebrew is one of the most profound and beautiful languages there is. It makes sense. It's God's people, right? And that word mantle had, had a, a, 
a power that came with it, but it also identified what a true prophet of God would wear. And it represented the power that was within the man, within the mantle. You know, one time he had a, he had a, uh, one of those ultimate challenges, you know, make for good like reality television, right? So you have, uh, you have Elijah and you have 400 prophets of the god Baal. And so Elijah says, build an altar to your god. And pray to your god. And let's see your god come down and burn the altar and take the sacrifice. And these 400 prophets of this god who is not really a god but an idol, they prayed and they, they, they just stormed their god. And they were cutting themselves. And they were doing whatever they had to do to try to bring down the power of a god who was no god at all. <laughs> and, and the funny thing is, is, you know, sometimes you read the Bible and you miss all the funny stuff. How many people know there's funny stuff in the Bible? <laughs> yeah? And so this is, this is exactly, if you don't read the Bible, this is, this is the kind of stuff you can find in there. And so, so Elijah's talking to the prophets and, you know, is, is your God too busy? What's he doing? Is he on the bowl? Look it up. Are you in the, is he in the bathroom locked up relieving himself right now and he can't come? There's funny stuff in the Bible if you read it. And he's mocking their God. And so, so, so Elijah, one man, one God. He says, uh, I'm going to build my altar. And not only that, I'm going, to take, I'm going to take all the water you can possibly get. I want you to soak it down. Matter of fact, build a moat around it. I want this thing so unburnable. And we're going to see what my God can do. And so they did that. And they prayed to heaven. And God came down. And the fire of God came down and, and took both altars. And took all the water. And took everything. And that's the power that Elijah brought from God. And then those 400 prophets ended up being executed. And so people knew that when this man was seen and his mantle was identified, well, there's the power of God. There is someone who's moving with the power of God. And, and it's, it's funny, a little later in the story, because this is so us. Anybody ever, like, uh, stand in a great, powerful place from God, and, like, five minutes later, you're scared of a mouse or something? <laughs> Anybody ever have, not you know, a mouse, but, like, like, you just saw God do great things, and you stood in faith, and God did great things, and this little teeny thing comes in, and you've got you wrecked, and you've got anxiety, and you've got all this stuff, right? And so, so uh, right after this, obviously the king and the queen are really upset because all their prophets are dead, you know? And so Jezebel, who was the, uh, the queen, uh, puts a hit out on, on Elijah. You know, so this guy just came down, and, and his God just destroyed 400 prophets. He's running from a woman. Just think about that for a second. Think about it. One moment he's here, and then he's here. And so the story goes on in 1 Kings chapter 19. And it says, the Lord came. Oh, this is, he's hiding. Elijah's hiding in a cave because he's being chased by a woman. All right? After that. All right? And so he, then he came to the cave, and he, he lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And, and he said to him, what are you doing here? Elijah. And he said, Elijah said, I'm a very zealous for the Lord and the God of hosts and the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, covenant, torn all your altars down, killed your prophets with the sword, and I'm, I'm the only one left. And now they're looking to kill me and take it away. So God says, go forth, stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great strong wind was rending mountains and, the break, and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. Uh, but the Lord was not in the wind. And, and then a great earthquake came, and, and the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then after the earthquake, fire came, and the Lord wasn't in the fire. But after the fire, a sound of a, a gentle blowing. And some versions say a still small voice. Because there's nothing more powerful than hearing the still small voice of God. Because it's more of an intimate touch. 
You know, we all want the powerful God that's going to wreck things, right? You know, show himself. But I tell you, when you hear the still, small voice of God, it changes your soul. And so Elijah heard it, and he wrapped his face in his mantle. Why did he wrap his face in his mantle? Because he knows he's a sinner, and he's fallen short. And the thing that identified him as a man of God was his mantle. So he covered himself in the thing that identified him and showed people the power. You know, in our new covenant in Jesus Christ, it's called being in Christ. It's putting on the righteousness of Christ because we're still broken human beings. But Jesus covers up us in his righteousness so we can stand before and petition and pray and, and commune with the Holy God. Amen. And so this is what Elijah is doing with his mantle. He's hiding his shame. And the one thing that God could look at and know the power that he had in this man. And he was hidden in his mantle. See, when God sees us as believers, he sees righteousness. You know, we can beat ourselves up because we do that, don't we? Because we know how we sin. You know, but when we gave our life to Christ, all our sins are covered. And yes, we should be convicted of our sins and get things better. But God doesn't see any of that stuff going on. That's all forgiven. That's being dealt with by the Holy Spirit and through the blood of Christ. And God sees you perfect. And God sees you in righteousness. You know, the, uh, the mantle of Elijah was his identifying with the Lord. And when you saw his mantle, you saw power. When uh, Elijah got out of that little jam, he uh, was traveling, and he met up another prophet called Elisha. And Elisha was drawn to follow Elijah because, you know, the power of a prophet at times was handed down. And so there were prophets who followed prophets, and, and prophets who were learning were following prophets. And so Elisha grabbed onto Elijah and, and just followed him. And he was coming near the end of his life. And, uh, and all the other prophets had left, you know, Elijah's about to die, why are you bother following him? And Elisha was, was faithful. And it got to the point where Elijah asked Elisha, what do you want? You know, just leave. Told him to leave. He said, no, I'm not leaving. And so Elisha says, I want a double portion of the power of God. When you leave, I want you to pass down your mantle to me. Because he knew the power in being identified as that type of prophet for God. And he asked a, he asked a challenging thing because... You want twice what Elijah has? How many people know someone that has incredible faith and is doing incredible things for God? How many people know someone like that? Right. You don't have to be saved. We all kind of know. You should be asking for twice the power that person has. You should not be asking for what someone else has. You should be asking for the next level. And Elisha got this. But what happened was Elijah got taken up to heaven on a fire chariot. There's two people in this world that have not died, for those who don't read the Bible too much. All right? There's Enoch, who walked with God and then was gone. And then there's Elijah, who God took home and hasn't faced death even as of yet. Those are the only two. You know, as a matter of fact, Jesus faced death. And Elijah and Enoch haven't faced death. And when Elijah went up, Elisha was waiting, and he threw him his mantle. And when Elijah asked Elisha, why would you want a double portion? Because you're asking for a hard thing. But what is he saying? Do you know what the life of a prophet was back then? Running from being stoned everywhere you went. Because you're telling people that you're falling short, you're sinning. You're not good people. God's not happy. Run from the rocks. <laughs> That's the life of a prophet. And so if you want the double power of God, you're going to have the double attacks 
of the world. But that's what he wanted. And as we build this faith we have in Jesus Christ, we have something Jesus talks about. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, apostles, one or the other, I didn't have much coffee. I don't even know why I'm talking like that. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We've heard that, haven't we? If you've been in church long enough. We're supposed to pick up our cross. Well, what is your cross? We need to understand what our cross is. If you're in the middle of a big financial disaster, it's a cross. If you just came from the doctor and you got a report you weren't that happy with, it's a cross. If you have a relationship that's busted and it's, it's tearing you apart, it's a cross. God didn't cause it, but we're commanded to pick it up. See, we wear a cross around our neck, don't we? You know? That's not your cross. Do you know that? That doesn't even make you a Christian. It really doesn't make you much of anything. You're just saying, I kind of identify with this story. I got a sword, which looks like a cross. But, you know, sometimes we, we think we can, we can put a cross around our neck and start having people think we're a Christian. Well, no, no. See, Jesus carried that cross. We can't carry that cross. But this is a memorial to the one who carried that cross. But it's not our cross. And, and we all know lots of people who wear a cross and are so far from God. We need to pick up our cross. See, Jesus' cross was his mantle. It is what he was allowed to bear that identified him and the power of God through the suffering and the conquest that came through that very thing he never would have chosen was the power of the living God. The way he walked through it with grace. Issuing forgiveness as they're putting nails into his hands and his feet. Telling the man next to him on the cross, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Take care of my mother. He was in the middle of the most painful experience, one of the most torturous things a human being can go through. Yet he was filled with grace and mercy. Right. And he cared about everyone else as life was leaving his body. And when he carried that cross down the, the uh, Via Della Rosa, he was proud to carry it. Painful as hell, but he was proud to carry it. You know, it tells us in Scripture that for the joy set before him, Jesus went to the cross. Everyone here who has given their life to Jesus Christ is part of the joy that Jesus experienced when he went the way of the cross. Because he knew you as he was going through that torture as he was being nailed to the cross, he thought of you and he thought of me. And that should break your heart at times. It should bring you to a place of gratitude that you've never experienced before. No one doesn't have a cross. But what are you doing with it? You know? Everyone raise their hands that they have some things going on in their life right now, right? Pretty much everybody. Are you leaving it on the ground to be totally ineffective and a wasted experience for God. See, God doesn't waste suffering, but we waste suffering. God has seen in most power during suffering. We need to pick up our cross and use it as a mantle to show the power of Jesus Christ to a world that is hopeless. 
because your cross is where you can show the glory of God. Without the cross of Jesus Christ, we're not in this room. The power of God is really seen in a much more minimal, minimal way. You know, the power of God is the love and the grace of the cross and raising Jesus out of the grave three days later to show us that we can be that. And we can go through the things that we go through with grace and mercy and trust because the end result is God's, it's not ours. We could try everything we want, but God's will is going to be done. And are we going to pick up that cross and put it on our back and carry it proudly? And even in the middle of some of the worst things, say, God is good. I know he's got it. I don't understand it all, but I know God. And let people see a smile on your face when it doesn't make any sense. <coughs> Experience some of the best sleep you've ever had in your life when everything around you is falling apart. See, when I went through my experience, God showed me the power of faith and showed me very early in my, um, my experience the purpose. And if you look into what you're going through, God has a purpose. And, and uh, it's the one moment I bring up a lot because it was a moment that it, it changed my life and actually changed a lot of lives. You know, and thank God one of those people are in this room. Because if I don't have that moment, I don't write the book. I don't sit there and I don't get to minister and I'm ministering a lot now. And when I had my first, my first treatment, I had a very bad reaction. And I was in the corner of the room, and uh, 10 minutes in, it wasn't even the chemo, it was the other stuff. My body just started tremoring, and I was, I was having a violent reaction to this new chemical that was both killing me and killing the disease at the same time. And nurses came running, and doctors came running, and you know, you never know what's going to happen with some of this stuff. And, uh, I'm, I'm just shaking uncontrollably. And so they gave me IV, uh, Demerol in my IV, calm my body down, bring everything back. And after a couple of minutes, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm in the corner of the room and I kind of kid around, you know, wherever I go somewhere, I sit in the corner of the room because nobody's going to be behind me. Anybody else like that? <laughs> you know, you go to a diner and you got to have the corner seat. You know? Come on, every biker in here should have their hand up. We're <laughs> all paranoid, aren't we? We are all paranoid people. You know, I don't want anybody behind me. And so after, after my body calmed down, I looked up and I saw about 20 people in the room, all hooked up, getting their treatments. And they were all on the edge of their seat, hoping that I'm going to be okay. Because now I'm one of them. And God spoke to me. And if you listen carefully, God will speak to you in that still small voice. And he said, look at the power of the chair I'm allowing you to sit in. A room full of hopelessness. And now there was someone with hope that was tangible for those people. And I knew that now I'm going to take this thing that I don't want and I'm going to show people the glory of God. If I die in a month, it's not my choice. If I die in 20 years, it's not my choice. Right now I'm going to show God to the world through this. It's not going to break me. It's not going to crumble me. I'm getting way ahead of myself, but that's okay. You know? All right. Jesus' suffering was a mantle he accepted to show God's glory to the world. Glory, splendor it was his mantle. The magnificence of the power of God and the bloody and battered man on the cross. Because he knew three days later he'd be walking out of the grave. And through that, you would have a chance, had a great life here, an extraordinary life for eternity. Going back to the, uh, the Old Testament and uh, winding down a little bit. The band playing tonight, or are we? Uh... Yeah, we're playing. We're riding. All right, we're riding. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 61 says, "The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, 
because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners. How many people are excited about that verse? Because that's talking about Jesus Christ, by the way. To proclaim the favorable day of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort those who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. And oh, here it is. The mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Notice he hasn't taken them out of their hard situation yet. And he's giving them a mantle of praise. He's bringing them to a place that they know that God is working. And so now the very thing they're going through, God is giving them as a mantle to praise him through the valley. Praise him through the challenge. Instead of mourning. That's what we want to do when we're going through crap, right? Poor me. Woe is me. Oh, life is just going to hell. All kinds of crap's going on. You know, that's, that's what we want to do. You know? But that's leaving it on the ground. Because God's got a powerful thing to do in whatever you're going through. We need to embrace it. And we need to move it, move in it. You know, and don't, don't lose what happens here. After he has given them a mantle of praise, they become oaks of righteousness. After he has given them the strength to go through this and the understanding while going through it, then they become strong people of faith, a strong nation of faith, because without the storm, there is no strength. It's a weak faith based on situations. You know, easy times do not make us oaks of righteousness. Amen? Amen. Because anybody can do that. You know, any faith, any religion out there can make you, it's not even oak of righteousness. It's something that looks big, and the biggest storm is going to blow it over because the, the roots are only going down three inches into the ground. You know, the roots of our strength of faith and our righteousness in Christ and the power and the joy and the victory is the roots go way down as you're trying to hold on to what you're going through. And Jesus is building a foundation that will not be broken. And then... After that, Isaiah goes on to say, they will rebuild the ancient ruins. How many people want their life rebuilt? God promises he'll do that. But you've got to go through the storm. You've got to go through the storm and, and go through it with grace and mercy like Jesus did. And he's going to resurrect your life just like he did with Jesus three days later when he walked out of the grave. Because we experience resurrection life now. I don't know if you know that. I don't know if you've heard that. You know? And there are people here that have experienced it going through challenges and going through health fights, going through relational things, going through all kinds of things, and they have peace and they have joy. And they know God is good. That's the kingdom of God now. That's eternal life now. Jesus didn't die so we have some great retirement plan. We've got to sit and worry and be anxious for the rest of our life, hoping that we'll just die so we can get to where we're supposed to be. This is where we're supposed to be. And new life in Christ will give you peace and joy. And you will stand in a place where people look at you and say, I don't know why they can do that. And then you have a door that's open. And you get to share. I could never do this. Jesus came in and did something. And all I know is everything is different now. And then you give him all the glory. They will raise up the former devastations. And you may be here, here today and you feel your life has been devastated by the things of this world. Well, God promises he will rebuild. It may not be exactly the same, but it'll be better. Amen. God promises you stand in that place and he's going to rebuild whatever devastated your life. Repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Doesn't matter how long you've gone through the trial, how much damage your life has been for how long. Drop of a hat, Jesus can make a change. And you have a man with praise instead of a spirit of fainting. We all have crosses, different. Mine's different than yours. 
but he allowed it in, in your life for a reason, so that he can draw close to you. So I shared this morning with a bunch of wayward youth, you know, because they're at a place and they need to know that God's allowing that because he loves them. You know? With my lymphoma came a responsibility and a purpose. Uh, this cross may end my life at any time. There's no guarantees. But we need to take a look at, at the ways of God. And I want to end with one or two scriptures, and then we'll, we'll, uh, I'm going to rock this place. Amen? Amen. Romans 8.28. We all know that, right? Yes. Have you ever continued reading? <laughs> Pass that. Because we want to know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. We quote it. People tell us when things are, are hard. But it goes on from there and says, For those he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. The image of his son is a man on a cross. And don't think you can get con conformed into the image of Christ and the glory and the peace and the grace and everything else without a cross. Because it's not going to happen. So read that. But God says all things do work together for good. Wherever, whatever you're going through right now in your life, no matter how bad it may seem, God is doing a good work if you embrace it, if you move in it, and you will never be the same. And you will come back on the other end of that challenge, and you'll look back and say, Lord, I can't believe I'm saying that, but if I had to go through that again, I'd take it to have what I have now. That's, right. That's the power of, of Jesus Christ. It says those he, who he predestined, he also called. You know, we're chosen and we're called. Yes. And he justifies us and... He also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. You now, we see this word glorified in Scripture, and sometimes we get confused. When you have something in your life that wants to wreck you, and you stand it in the power of Jesus Christ, and show people the power of God in it, that is what is termed a glory. The world sees the power of Jesus Christ when you're standing in a place that's unbelievable in the middle of a hard battle. And God is glorified. And your faith skyrockets. The scripture says we're saved from glory to glory, the perfecting of our faith. So you have something come in, and I don't want this, but we're gonna, we'll just roll with it, whatever God does in it. At the end of it, your faith is here. All right? And I'll tell you, I had a motorcycle wreck in 2006. My faith was there, my faith was there. All right? That's pretty good. I was feeling pretty good. But I'll tell you, cancer? My faith is above the ceiling. You know? Because you can't face a battle like that and not have your faith go ridiculous. Amen. But you have to embrace it. And that's why I talk about it. And sometimes people get upset because I talk about my cancer a lot. I'm going to talk about my cancer a lot because it has showed the glory of God in my life. Amen. And it's helping a lot of people. You know? And we cannot be afraid of a word. This is a, this is a message three weeks from now. We can't be afraid of a word because of what the images come in our life. You know, because Satan has taken the power of words. And when someone says cancer, we get these feelings, we get these emotions. It's only a word. It's only a word. But it's a word that can actually be powerful for Jesus Christ. I'm going to skip to the end because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm rolling a little bit. See you guys later. Yep. All right. Man, I'm kind of, I'm rolling tonight. I'll be dancing soon. <laughs> you know? See, within the power of your cross, is the power of Jesus Christ. Resurrection power can only come with the cross. Thank God there probably be no one in this room that faces the kind of cross our Savior did. But crosses we will face. And it's within the things we would never choose that hides the most profound power you will ever walk in this earth, given by Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. You know, when, when uh, Jesus was about to raise Lazarus from the dead, 
En naar mijn kern perspectief. Martha was upset because Jesus took his time. If you read the story, he waited another two days to make sure dead was really dead. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, it's a scripture that we probably have all heard a thousand times, but some people need to hear it again, or maybe the first time. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he does. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you understand what he just said? We have two entities. We have our spiritual entity. We have our physical entity. Our spiritual entity is really where you live. It's where you love, where you hate, where you have anxiety, where you have fear, where you have hope, where you have purpose. Our physical entity is just this bag of bones and flesh and you know, Satan just does his best work trying to mess with this. But your spirit never die. Are you happy about that? Oh, yeah. You know? Hallelujah. It's not even a matter of not dying down the road. See, when, when, when you can step into this faith and have joy and peace in the middle of stuff, you're alive. See, I survived most of my life. I existed most of my life. I have gone through as hard of things, even harder afterwards, but I have, I, have, I have experienced incredible life through those things, in those things, and because of those things. And, and, I, and the worst of it, I love my life. Amen. You know? It's a great day to be alive. Amen. I usually begin with that. Today I'm emptying with it. I'm em emptying. I'm, uh, I'm ending with it. It's a great day to be alive. And you need to wake up every morning, no matter what you're facing, and know today is a great day to be alive because I have Jesus Christ and I have resurrection power. And whatever that thing is, shove it. Say you take it and you shove it because I ain't going to let it beat me. And I'm not going to drag it around and have it hold me down. I'm going to pick it up I'm going to put it on my shoulder. I'm going to carry it on. I'm going to show people because death has nothing on me. Finances has nothing on me. My faith is not in people. I don't care as much about the love of people as I do about the love of Jesus, and he will never separate us from his love. There is nothing in this existence that can separate us from the love we have in Christ Jesus. That's where the rubber meets the road. And when we can stand there, everything else is a walk in the park. Yes, we have to fight through it, and yes, it's challenging. But with Jesus, life is incredible. You know? What you have on your life, in your life right now, you just have a decision to make. As a believer, are you going to leave it there? Because Satan would like you to leave it there and show the world a defeated believer. He would love you to do that. Unfortunately, many do. And that's why the world doesn't see the power of Jesus Christ. Or are you going to pick that cross up and bear the burden of it which in Jesus is not a, a burden at all. You know, he says, my, my burden is light. My yoke is easy. You know? Yes. See you, man. Okay. So you have a choice today of what you're going to do with that one thing that you're not comfortable with. Are you going to pick it up? You're going to brace it? And you're going to show the world God's glory? You're going to let it defeat you? You know, I pray that you, you make the decision of taking your cross, picking it up, Wear it as a mantle that people are going to see God through that thing. You know? People see God through my cancer. Amen. It's the way it's supposed to be. Amen. You know? There are people here that, that people see God through um, broken relationships. That you're here and, you, and life is good. And, and yeah, you kind of wish maybe you know, God would do some things and that's okay. That's right. But you're not showing that. You're saying, well, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied. God, God's got me in a place. I know he's doing the work. Uh, and I'm going to let everybody know who's out there freaking out because of their relationships that I'm good. You know, because God's got something better for me. And he's, he's maybe making me wait, but it's going to be worth the wait. Amen? Because you've got choices to make. And, and those, those in here, you know, those in here that haven't surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, um, 
Without Jesus Christ, none of what I've talked about tonight is available to you. Because as much as you come to church, and as much as you hear God's word, if you don't surrender your life to the one who will give you life, you have no life. And so the things of the world are going to keep breaking you. They're going to keep dragging you to places you don't want to go, to make more decisions you don't want to make. But the good news is today, things can change. And so before I close in prayer, I want everybody to bow their heads and, uh, and close your eyes. Because God wants to, wants to change people today. He wants to reach into lives. You know, the day I gave my life to Christ was the most phenomenal day I will ever have. And I'm going to put a simple question. If you're here today and you've never established a relationship with Jesus Christ in your life, I mean a true surrender of your will, your life, I'd like you to simply raise your hand. Say, today I want, I want to step into this new life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else before I pray? Thank you. Praise God. God has spoken to you today. God, that still small voice has, has touched several people today. Let's all pray this with those who just made a decision. Amen? Amen? So let's all pray this again for some of us, but more profoundly for the first time with meaning for some of us. Lord God, I thank you for bringing me here this evening. I know I'm a sinner. I can't get this life right without you. Lord, I ask your son to come into my life. I believe he walked this earth as a man. He went to a cross and died for me so that all my sins would be forgiven. But he walked out of the grave three days later to come back to life for him, but, but to make new life available for me. I surrender my life. It is no longer my own. I give it to you. I live for Jesus Christ. I thank you for new life. Come in and change me. I will give you all the glory. And I thank you in my Savior's name. Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Scriptures, scriptures tell us that right now all of heaven is celebrating Amen. because for every single person who comes to the knowledge of Jesus Christ that comes into the family, all of heaven celebrates because it is a big deal. Amen. If there was one person, Jesus would have died for that one person. Amen. And so if you're here today, the, the angels are celebrating. We want to, we want to congratulate you. We want to, at the end of the service, we want to pray with you. We have some things we want to send you home. We don't want to leave you without resources, but we're excited. Are you excited? Yeah. God, is, God is doing a tremendous thing in the Rushing Wind Biker Church. This didn't just start tonight. It started a couple weeks ago. It's happening here, and it's happening with our outreach. There's a crack in the realm of darkness, yeah. and we're going to push through it, and we're going to break through it, and we're not going to stop. Amen? Yeah. No matter what Satan comes at us with. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you that, that he has given us the strength and the power that he had when he walked out of that grave. Lord, we thank you for the power that you have put in us to fight off anything the world will come at us with. Lord, we, we ask you for the strength to pick up the things that are trying to break us, that are trying to crush us. And Lord, help us to use that as a mantle to show the world just how good God is when life tends to be bad. And Lord, we wait for the praise reports. We praise for the back end of these trials as we get to look back in them and see the work you did in us. That's the prayer I have for these people tonight, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you for your son. 
we want to celebrate. And as we say amen, let's give God another clap offer.
excited? Are we excited? God's moving, ain't he? You know? And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Let's pray. And uh, those who, who, uh, who made a decision like to come up, we'd like to pray with you. I uh, want my wife to come down and, uh, and Christina and, and some of the women to pray with, uh, with the women. And Ms. Bach will come up here and we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll usher you in. Amen. 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 Father, we thank you for this place. We thank you for the movement you started to create here, Father. Lord, there's a groundswell of something great about to happen. Lord, we're seeing it in a lot of different fronts. Lord, we just uh, we pray for those who have uh, stepped into your kingdom tonight. Lord, don't let the enemy try to rob them and deceive them that what happened today wasn't real, for it's as real as we're standing right here. And Lord, we thank you for new life in Christ. We ask you to send our people with power. Lord, let them go out and wreck the world of darkness. Lord, being offensive, not backpedaling, but moving forward, taking ground, and just taking territory from the enemy. And Lord, we, we just thank you, and we just, we just praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.